So according to a recent study conducted on YouTube, turns out word problems are the hardest questions on the SAT. And proportion is one of the toughest versions of these word problems. Like the questions that look something like this and something like that, these questions are all testing you on proportion. But students are having trouble with them because they are missing this one thing. And that one thing is exactly what this video is all about. And as always, we're gonna go over in this three-step process. First, we're gonna talk about the concept Second, we're going to talk about the examples. And third, we're going to go over some official college board practice exams that are easy, medium, and hard in difficulty. And lastly, everything we talk about in this video is going to be nicely organized into this two-page worksheet. And the worksheets are also going to have additional set of practice problems. And if you're really trying to raise your SAT score, then I highly, highly recommend you print these two worksheets out follow it along with the video, take some notes on the way, solve these questions with me. And by the end of this video, you're going to be the master of proportions. You can find these worksheets in the pinned comment down below. So if you're ready to get started and score higher on your next SAT, then go down below and smash not the like button, but the subscribe button this time because only 20 something percent of you guys are actually subscribed to the channel. So let's get started with today's video. So when it comes to these proportion questions, one of the reasons students are having trouble is because one, because they don't understand what proportion is and two, they don't know how to apply it to these questions. So we're going to go over the concept behind it first and then go over the examples. And if there's one thing you need to know about proportions is that proportion is actually just a shortcut that you can use in a linear scenario. Now with that in mind, let's go over a couple examples on what I mean by a shortcut. So first example, the question says, if Kevin eats two cookies every three minutes, then how many cookies can be eaten in nine minutes, right? Pretty simple question. We can make a quick table on it. Cookies and time in minutes right there. He eats two cookies every three minutes. Then when another three minute goes by, he's gonna eat six cookies or four cookies. And nine minutes, six, so on and so forth. And how many pieces can he eat in nine minutes? Well, just six pieces, right? The numbers were pretty small. We didn't really need a shortcut or use the proportion, but let's go to the next question. If Kevin eats two cookies every three minutes, then how many cookies can be eaten in 396 minutes, right? Obviously, one way to answer this question is go all the way down, keep going until you reach 396 minutes and you'll find out how many cookies can be eaten. But you don't wanna do that because that's just a big waste of time and you have a time limit on the SAT. And to shortcut yourself to the answer, that's where proportion comes in handy. And proportion looks something like that. And the question tells us he eats two cookies every three minutes. And how many cookies can be eaten in 396 minutes? Well, do we know how many cookies there are? We don't, just put a variable in it. And from there, you can just cross multiply and find the value of X or the number of cookies. So long story short, what we used over here is known as proportion. And proportion is a shortcut you can use in a linear scenario. And if you're wondering, can we use this proportion anywhere on any question? No, in order for you to use them, there are actually two requirements. The first one is that there must be some kind of linear relationship presented in the question. There must be some kind of linear scenario inside the question. And what I mean by that is things like he eats two cookies every three minutes, right? Two cookies every three minutes, that's a linear relationship because every time three minutes goes by, you're gonna increase it by the same amount. And the reason why this is called a linear relationship is because if you graph these data points on a graph, it looks like a line. So for example, we have two, three, and four, six, and six, nine. That'll be this, right, like so. Two, three, two, three, two, three. It looks like a line. That's why it's called a linear relationship. And the keywords you might want to remember are going to be one, every, like, two cookies every three hours that's a linear relationship and the next one is going to be per he drives 40 miles per hour it's going to be a linear relationship whenever you see these two words and if you're a little bit confused right now it's okay we're going to go over more examples and it's going to make more sense as we go now in addition to the linear relationship the second requirement to use proportion is that the units must be consistent in the proportion right and the proportion is shown right here and what do I mean by units must be consistent? Well, the thing is we did cookies and cookies on the top and minutes and minutes on the bottom. And because both cookies are on the top and both of the minutes are at the bottom, we can say that the units are consistent. 
But if it looked something like, if you set your equation up as cookies and minutes right here and minutes and cookies, the units are not consistent. It should be cookies and cookies or minutes and minutes, not cookies and minutes. It just doesn't make sense. So the units must be either consistent horizontally or it's not the most popular way, but it could also be consistent vertically. So for example, this exact proportion can be also written as two cookies is equal to three minutes. Then X cookies is equal to 396 minutes, right? It can be consistent vertically like that as well. So in summary, before you use proportions, you have to make sure that there is some kind of linear relationship presented in the question. And while you're doing the proportion, you have to make sure that your units are consistent either horizontally or vertically. So if the concept is making sense, let's apply it to some of these examples. So the first one, the question says, Kevin drives 45 miles per hour. How long would it take for him to drive 315 miles, right? Can we use proportion here? Well, we have to check whether there's linear relationship. Is there? Yes, 45 miles per hour, that's a linear relationship, which means we can set up a proportion which means we can set up a proportion to find our answer. And what would it look like? Well, he drives 45 miles per one hour. And how many hours will it take for him to drive 315 miles? Do we know how many hours are? We don't plug in a variable X right there. So how do we solve it? We just cross multiply 45 X is equal to 315. And if you divide both sides by 45, you're going to get seven as your answer is going to take seven hours. And don't worry if the numbers are getting big, you're going to be able to use your calculator. Just focus on understanding the concept behind how to use proportion and how to set up proportion. Next question. During the SAT, Sally solves three questions for every three minutes. If the exam contains 75 questions, how long will it take her to finish? So where's the linear relationship? Well, solves three questions for every three minutes right there which means we can now use proportion. And one important point here, guys, make sure you identify the linear relationship before you set up a proportion, because what students do is they go with their gut feeling. They're like, oh, I feel like I should use proportion here. But no, don't do that. Don't be like them. Before you set it up, make sure you have a linear relationship because that's what allows you to set up a proportion. So she solves three questions per three minutes. And exam contains 75 questions. How long will it take? Again, same thing, just cross multiply. 3Q is equal to 75 times three, divide by three on both sides. Three goes away, three goes away. Q is equal to 75. It takes her 75 minutes. And to make sure we did everything correctly, were our units consistent in the proportion? Well, minutes, minutes, hours, hours, we're good to go. Questions, questions, minutes, minutes, we are good to go here as well. So as long as you understand these three things right here, it's going to be a very simple process. So let's go over some practice questions. So this is going to be a easy example and we're gonna try the medium and hard ones afterward. So first, let's read the question. So a physician prescribes a treatment in which a patient takes two teaspoons of medication every six hours for five days, okay? According to the prescription, how many teaspoons of medication should the patient take in a 24 hour period? Now, do we have a linear relationship presented in the question? Yes, it says the patient takes two teaspoons every six hours, right? Two teaspoons every six hours. And question is asking how many teaspoons of medication in 24 hours? So how many teaspoons in 24 hours? Simple stuff, cross multiply, we get 48 is equal to 6x, x is equal to 8, 8 is our answer. Now that was pretty easy, but let's try a more difficult question. So the question says, graphene, which is used to used in the manufacture of integrated circuits is so thin that a sheet weighing in one ounce can cover up to seven football fields. Okay. If a football field has an area of approximately one and one third acres, about how many acres could 48 ounces of graphene cover? So a lot of information here, let's organize it first. So we know that one ounce of graphene can cover up to seven football fields. And we know that one field is equal to about four thirds acres. And based on that, the question is asking 48 ounces can cover up to not how many football fields, but how many acres of land, 
Well, in order for us to find the total area, we just need to first find out how many fields there are. Because we know that for every one field, that's 4 over 3 acres. One field is 4 over 3 acres. So if we know how many fields there are, then we can find out how many acres there are. Because the thing is, that's a linear relationship right there, which means we can set up a proportion like we did over here. So our main goal right now is for us to find the total number of fields with 48 ounces. And how can we find that? Well, we also have another linear relationship here. For every one ounce can cover up to seven fields. One ounce can cover up to seven fields. So one ounce is seven fields. So 48 ounce can cover up how many fields? We don't know, let's find out. Are our units consistent? Yes, ounce, ounce, fields, fields. We are now good to go. So if we just cross multiply over here, we're gonna get X is equal to seven times 48. Seven times 48 is going to be 336, which tells us that 48 ounces can cover up to 336 football fields, right? So the total number of fields is going to be 336 fields right there. And how many acres is 336 fields? Well, we can use this proportion we set up earlier. We know that one field is going to be about four thirds acres. So 336 fields is going to be how many acres? X acres, cross multiply. X is equal to 336 times four over three. And that's going to be times four divided by three, which is going to be 448. So our answer is going to be about 448 acres or the question is asking approximately, which means we can round up our answer into 450. Make sense? So again, it's all about understanding when to use proportion and using it correctly. So that was a medium difficulty question, but let's go over one of the toughest questions when it comes to proportions. It's gonna be pretty tough, but follow along. It's gonna be pretty simple. So the question says, George took a nonstop flight from Dallas to Los Angeles, and the total distance was 1,233 miles, okay? The plane flew at a speed of 460 miles per hour for the first 75 minutes of the flight and at a speed of 439 miles per hour for the remainder of the flight. Ah, it's getting juicy. So to the nearest minute, for how many minutes did the plane fly at a speed of 439 miles per hour? So a lot of information, let's organize it. So the question says he's going from where to where? He's going from Dallas to Los Angeles and the total distance is going to be 1,233 miles. So for the first portion of the flight, it flew at a speed of 460 miles per hour for 75 minutes. And for the remainder of the flight, it flew at 439 miles per hour. We don't know how long it was, but that's what the speed was. And the question is asking us to find how many minutes did he fly at 439 miles per hour? Well, what we have right now is this linear rate right there, 439 miles per hour, right? So it goes 40, 439 miles for every one hour or for every 60 minutes. So if we know what the distance is, if we know how long this distance is, what we can do is we can put those miles right here and we can find out how many minutes he traveled for that speed. Like, does that make sense? Let's say this portion of the flight was like 1,000 miles, then we can just put 1,000 miles here because if the plane's going 439 miles per every 60 minutes, then 1,000 miles, how long did it take? If it took him like 90 minutes, that means this portion of the flight was just 90 minutes. So our goal here right now is to find out the distance that it traveled for the second portion of the flight. And how can we find that portion? Well, it's actually pretty simple because as long as we can find out how many miles it traveled in the first portion of the flight, we can just subtract how much that was and that will give us how much is remaining. And how can we find out how many miles it traveled in the first portion? Well, if you guess the proportions, you're in the right track. So we know it's going at a 460 miles per hour, which is linear rate, which means we can use proportions. So we know that it travels 460 miles every one hour. And we're wondering what was the distance flown in 75 minutes? 
right? And we're having one issue here because hours and minutes units are not consistent. So we're gonna have to change one or the other. And I'm just gonna change hour into minutes. So one hour is the same thing as 60 minutes. So I'm just gonna put it right there. Units are matching up. Let's cross multiply and find out what the distance was. So we get 60x is equal to 460 times 75, which means 460 times 75 is going to be 34,500. And if you divide that by 60 on both sides, we get x is equal to 575. That means we know that the distance here was actually just 575 miles for the first 75 minutes. Which means, which means from the whole total flight over here, we know that first portion was 575. And to find the remainder, all we have to do is just subtract it from the total, which is 1233. So 1233 minus 575, we get 658. So the remainder distance over here was actually just 658. So the remaining distance here was actually just 658 miles. That's how far they flew at the speed of 439 miles per hour. And based on this information, we can find out how long the flight was because it goes 439 miles for every 60 minutes, then 658 miles, how many miles is that, right? So from here, we can just cross multiply 439x is equal to 60 times 658. So if we do that, 60 times 658, we get 439x is equual to 39480. And if we divide it on both sides, we get x is equal to just 89.9. .9. And when your numbers come out that close, that means you're probably doing something right. And the question is asking, to the nearest minute, right? To the nearest minute, how many minutes did he fly? Well, it's 89.9 .9 or just 90 minutes. That's going to be our final answer. So this question was actually one of the toughest questions in this whole exam because it was number 35. It's one of the last questions on the whole section four. The only way to solve this question was by using proportions. And if you didn't understand how to use proportions, you wouldn't have been able to solve this question at all. And if this question is looking very, very tough right now, that's completely normal because it's not an easy question. It's meant to be a hard question. But as you do more practice and get a better understanding of the concept, you're gonna know exactly what to do the next time you see these questions on your next SAT. And the key here is for you to understand the concept and do the practice questions, which can all be found in the worksheet linked in the pinned comment down below. So I hope you guys found this video helpful. If it did, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and I'll see you on the next video.